Welcome to Dr. Beatty's Chemistry Essentials, A-Level Chemistry Made Easy. In this video, we're going to be looking at phenol and its reactivity. So phenols are benzene rings, uh, one shown here, connected directly from one of the carbons to a hydroxyl group. So the name phenol originates from phenyl for a benzene when it is not the main substituent. And the derivation from that is the phen, or the phen. And then our hydroxy group is just like alcohols, it ends in ol, so we end up with the overall name phenol. So phenols, because of this dual functionality, so they have both a benzene ring, which we know from previous videos undergoes electrophilic substitution, and then we have this hydroxyl group, the OH, that can undergo a variety of different reactions also. Now these reactions are similar to the alcohol group, which also contains the hydroxyl functionality of the OH, but they are different. And that's because the hydroxyl group is attached to this benzene ring. So one of the things, first of all, is the OH group acts as a weak acid. So if we were to draw the phenol group, then as a weak acid, some of these hydrogens are going to break their bond with oxygen with the two electrons in the covalent bond being dumped onto the oxygen of the phenol, forming the phenoxide ion. And this name comes from obviously our stem phenol. And then when we have this anion, this oxygen anion, we've got the oxide, leaving behind a H plus ion and what we should know is anything that releases H plus ions makes something acidic because acidity is all to do with the concentration of H plus ions in a solution. And when dealing with acids, we usually use this sort of generic formula here, HA, where A is the rest of the molecule that's the acid. So everything from oxygen through to here is our A. This is our H. And you can see that's dissociated to leave everything and the H plus. Now we know it's a weak acid because we've got these reversible arrows. And because it's a weak acid, it will only react with the strong alkali sodium hydroxide. Now sodium hydroxide would also react with not only phenol, but a carboxylic acid. And carboxylic acids, just in case you don't remember the functional group, look like this. So it's always the COOH on the end of a molecule, and they are more acidic than a phenol. And the reason we're commenting on the increasing acidity as we go between phenol and carboxylic acid is because only the more acidic would react with a weaker base. So if I present a weaker base below the sodium hydroxide now, which is a strong alkali, and this particular metal carbonate that I'm presenting is sodium carbonate, it's a weak base, compared to a strong alkali, this will react with the carboxylic acid, but does not react with the phenol. It's, the phenol is not acidic enough to react with this weak base. However, even though the phenol is a weak acid, it can react with a strong alkali. So it's important to understand this because this is on the specification that in order to understand the weak acidity of the phenol, you need to know that it reacts with a strong alkali like sodium hydroxide, but does not react with a weak base like a carbonate. Whereas carbonic acids are a stronger acid and so do react with both of these. And you could see this is a kind of chemical test to see if you've got a phenol or a carbonic acid in your sample. So if you had an unknown in front of you, if you added some sodium carbonate, you would see the product of its reaction with carboxylic acid, which is the formation of carbon dioxide. And just remembering, really simple equation here. Remember, it's an acid, carboxylic acid, metal carbonate gives salt water plus carbon dioxide. And that's what you're seeing. So you'll see a release of CO2. So you'll see some effervescence or fizzing, whereas you wouldn't see that with a phenol. Now we're just going to look at what happens then if we do, in terms of equations, react to phenol with a alkali, strong alkali like sodium hydroxide. So we're going to just draw out a phenol. 
So here we have Athena with a substituted methyl group on it, but that does not have any bearing on the reaction with sodium hydroxide. What happens is a pretty much irreversible reaction of where the sodium hydroxide acting as a base reacts with this acid, albeit a weak acid, to form the age-old pattern of a acid plus base gives salt and water. So obviously the water is an easy one to do. The salt itself is based on the phenoxide ion. And obviously because we've got this negative charge here and you can see we've got an Na, so we're going to have a sodium cation that counter balances this charge. And so the name of this particular salt is sodium phenoxide. And just remember, as with naming any salt, it's always the metal first, followed by the non-metal component. So just like sodium chloride, it's just that this whole non-metal thing is collectively called the phenoxide iron. So in this case, unlike the sodium carbonate reacting with a carboxylic acid, you're not going to see any effervescence because none of the products are gas. All you would see is that phenol, which is a weak acid, is going to be neutralized by the base. So you end up with a neutral solution. Obviously, that only works if you've got equivalent amounts of the sodium hydroxide to the weak acid. If you have more than one of the other, then you're still going to have something that is not neutralized. Now, just as we've taken an acid and reacted with a base to form a salt and water, we can actually take this salt and react it with a strong acid and we reverse it. So here we've just taken the sodium phenoxide from up here. We're adding a strong acid to it, a source of H plus ions. And then what's going to happen is that H plus ion displaces the Na plus here, which reforms the phenol, the original phenol that was up here, and then leaving behind chloride ion and a sodium ion to form the salt sodium chloride. So it's basically a displacement reaction because all you've done is you have swapped out the sodium plus ion for the H plus ion reforming the phenol and reforming a new salt, whereas this was the salt previously. So that concludes the information around the hydroxyl or the old part and its effect on reactivity of phenol. We're now going to look at the other part of this, which is the benzene ring and how the electrophilic substitution reactions undergo with a phenol. Now it's slightly different from benzene, owing to the fact that there is an OH directly attached to the benzene ring that actually changes the electronics, the electron density around this ring, therefore changing the reactivity when it comes to electrophilic substitution reactions undergone by phenol rings. So to understand why phenol undergoes reactions with electrophiles via electrophilic substitution much more easier than benzene, we need to look at the pi system in both benzene and phenol. Now, I just want you to pause the video here and see if you can come up with the diagram to represent the benzene pi system. Um, and also, before you draw that pi system, how the p orbitals look around this six-membered ring. Okay, so around benzene, each carbon has a p orbital. And these p orbitals combine together to form a pi system that is both above and below the ring. So there's the pi system above, and there we have the pi system below. So it's this source of electron density that means it really wants to attack electrophiles. So putting something that is electron deficient near it, these electrons can basically reach out and form a bond with the electrophile. If we then turn our attention to phenol, we've still got this six-membered carbon ring, each of these having a p orbital. But what we also have is an oxygen that also has p orbitals, and that's right next door to this p orbital. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, hold on, each of the carbons in both benzene and in phenol have hydrogens attached to them. And if we just focus in on this hydrogen here, which is the same as this hydrogen on phenol. Now, why can't these actually have any influence on the pi system? Well, it's because this is a sigma bond between the carbon and the hydrogen. And that sigma bond 
results from the s orbital in the hydrogen combining with the s orbital in the carbon so hydrogen doesn't have any electrons in any p orbitals so it can't have a p orbital here remember its electronic configuration for hydrogen is 1s1 and so there are no electrons available for any p orbitals however oxygen on the other hand has the electronic configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. So it has two sets of electrons in the p orbitals. We're just showing one of those lone pairs in this orbital here. The other one will be at a slightly different orientation that cannot overlap with the pi system of the ring. So with this now being adjacent and at the right angle, then what we get is this oxygen pair of electrons in a p orbital overlapping with the pi system in the ring and so it provides extra electrons into the ring so you start to get a pi system above the ring that's a bit skewed because it's overlapping over the oxygen p orbitals and then you'll get a pi system below the ring also like so and now with this ele extra electron density around the ring we therefore have a stronger area of electron density. So when this meets an electrophile, that is electron deficient, there is a greater attraction between the highly electron dense area here and our electrophile. Now the take home message for this and for writing in the exam is as follows. An electron pair is donated from the p orbital of the oxygen of that phenol into the pi system and that's our explanation for why it undergoes electrophilic substitution much easier than benzene. Now this therefore has implications in how we undergo bromination and nitration of a phenol in the lab. So looking at phenol and brominating it what we need is free equivalents of bromine and what this produces is the tri-substituted version. Now the particular positions that the bromine have taken up are really important. So remember when we were naming phenols, the carbon that is directly attached to the oxygen of the phenol is carbon 1 and all the other substituents we're trying to get the lowest combination. It doesn't matter if I go left or right around this ring, it will give me the same pattern. And here you can see we've got bromine at 2, 4, and 6. So the name of this molecule that's produced is 246-tribromophenol. Now something you should remember is that this product, 246-tribromophenol, has an antiseptic smell. So that's a one way of identifying it. And also, obviously we needed free bromines because we are tri-substituting. In terms of substitution, we have therefore taken the hydrogens that were at positions 2, 4, and 6, and they combine with the free bromines left over to form free hydrogen bromide molecules. Now, one thing to note is because we're using bromine water here, then what is going to happen is... Whenever you use bromine water, it is a sort of an orange red solution. And because it gets used up in the bromination to form this product, then it gets decolorized. So that's another observation that you should be aware of. Now, this all links back to this idea of phenol undergoing reactions with electrophiles much easier than benzene, because we didn't need a halogen carrier which you would do if you were reacting bromine with just normal benzene. And also we end up with tri-substitution. And that's because this is just so much more reactive. So it's quite happy to take on board three new bonds with bromine and substitute out those hydrogens. Whereas benzene will only do this to form a mono-substituted product. Now, a side note, the reason that you get substitution at 2, 4, and 6 is because the phenol group is what's known as an electron donating group. And these groups substitute at the 2, the 4, or the 6 position when something undergoes electrophilic substitution. 
Now we're gonna look at this in more detail in the video titled Electron Donating Groups and Electron Withdrawing Groups. So we won't go into much more detail here, but just so that you can take away that phenol is an electron donating group. Right, we're gonna turn our attention now to the nitration of phenol. So phenol only requires dilute nitric acid and room temperature. At the bottom here, you can see benzene. It required not concentrated nitric acid and sulfuric acid catalyst, and then 50 degrees to get mononitration. So the conditions are much milder, and that's all linked back to this idea of phenol undergoing reactions with electrophiles much easier because of the activation of the OH group donating electrons into the ring. So what you actually get when you take phenol and react with nitric acid, well, due to phenol being an electron donating group, we are going to substitute either at the two, the four, or the six position. And it just so happens it chooses either two or four to substitute, like so. Uh, remembering, obviously, it's a substitution reaction, so we've got our two and our four hydrogens, depending on which one is created, being a byproduct, and so our byproduct is always water with nitration. So you're going to get a mixture of two nitrophenol, some of the molecules being substituted, and then some of the molecules are going to be four nitrophenol. Now, some people may have already spotted or have the question of why isn't it six substituted? That's just because obviously our combination here, if we went round this side of the ring and called this two, three, four, five, six, then that would give us the same product. But remember, we're always trying to number in order to get the lowest set of numbers for our substituents. And so numbering the nitro group as two here is going to give you that. So two nitrophenol and six nitrophenol would look the same, but because of our IUPAC numbering, it always has to be two nitrophenol. Now, whilst you can get both two nitrophenol and four nitrophenol, for the exam, you should just be drawing the two nitrophenol as this is the one specifically given in the specification. However, knowledge of this won't hurt because when you're looking at electron donating and withdrawing groups, they could put this in a, as an example and get you to work out that a phenol OH must therefore be electron donating. Okay, so now I just want you to pause the video and see if you can remember the key points in order to explain this question. It's five marks on offer. Have a go. Okay, so in this question, we're going to have to compare the structures of benzene, phenol, and cyclohexene. The first things we need to discuss are all to do with p orbitals and the pi bonds. So first of all, let's focus in on benzene. So we've got pi bonds are formed from the carbon p orbitals, and they're delocalized, so really key to include that. And always nod to the fact that you know that the pi system is both above and below the ring. Now, Compared to this, phenol, not only does phenol have the pi bonds that benzene has, it also has a lone pair of electrons from the oxygen p orbital that is delocalized into the ring. And then our final thing to compare is that of cyclohexene. And here we need to comment that unlike benzene and phenol, which has delocalized systems, the pi system is localized between the two carbons of the double bond. Now with this, benzene itself, because of the delocalized nature, has a lower electron density than phenol. And then even though it's got a pi system here, it also has a lower electron density than the cyclohexene. Now this seems for a second counterintuitive because you'd think that this has three double bonds which are all delocalized, whereas this only has one double bond. But because this is localized, and this is the equivalent of just a double bond, these, each of these carbon atoms is the equivalent of kind of between a single and a double bond, so 1.5. So you've got 1.5 versus a 2. So this has a high electron density just because of the localized nature of it. Now that then links to bromination. Benzene cannot polarize 
uh, Br2 molecule. So what we mean by that is the bromine, which normally just has instantaneous di dipole, when it gets close to the benzene ring, this can't induce a dipole there. So it can't make there be a permanent dipole on bromine. And so if you just took bromine on its own, because this does not happen, you can't have, you don't generate an electrophile. And so the benzene won't react with this. Instead, that's why we need a halogen carrier. On the other hand, because of the OH group here feeding into this pi system, that just increases the electron density just that bit more that we can actually term it as a high electron density. And it therefore can act similarly to our cyclohexene pi bond. It can polarize Br2. So when you take a bromine molecule that's usually neutral and put it near either the cyclohexene or a phenol, then what happens is the electrons get repelled away. And so you get a delta positive bromine and a delta negative bromine. And it's this that then can act as electrophile. And that is why phenol just reacts with bromine molecules, as does cyclohexene. Now, cyclohexene obviously does an addition reaction, whereas this does an electrophilic substitution. But neither of these require a halogen carrier whereas benzene does require a halogen carrier to do any substitution with bromine. So just for your completeness, if you talked about electron density and stated that benzene was low, but these two were high density, that's the fourth mark. And then if you're linking that to polarization, so this bottom line of ideas, then that would be the fifth mark. Now, I think this is a really difficult question. There's lots going on. It's very synoptic. So even if you just got three out of the five marks, you're doing really well. But hopefully with this explanation, this understanding now, you can get a five out of five for this type of question. Now, the final set of questions I just want you to have a go at, these four questions here, the top two are examples of benzene and phenol reacting and undergoing bromination. So I just want you to come up with the reagents and conditions above the arrow and also the products that will be formed. And then do the same for nitration here. So reagents and conditions and the products. So pause the video now. Don't look at your notes. See if you can remember it. Okay, so the first one was benzene. So this is different from obviously phenol. You need a halogen carrier and bromine. And the product of this will be as followed. So as long as you've drawn a monobrominated product, it's absolutely fine. The bromine can be on any of these different um, carbon atoms. It cannot be on this carbon. Um, and then also your byproduct is going to be HBr. Now with phenol, the reagents are just bromine and we need three equivalents of it. We are then going to form the product, which is going to be compared to this position, the one, we're going to form the 246 tribromophenol. So there we have the two, the four here, and then the six here. And you're going to form three hydrogen bromides. And so this is a tribrominated species only with phenol. So nitration with benzene requires both concentrated nitric acid and concentrated sulfuric acid and 50 degrees Celsius. And this forms the monobrominated nitro benzene and then water as the byproduct. And then finally, the nitration of pheno at the bottom. This requires only dilute nitric acid and room temperature. And the product here is in relation to the phenol group, we are going to produce a 2-nitrophenol or a 4-nitrophenol on nitration under these conditions. So hopefully you did okay recording that. Um, I would definitely recommend making flashcards for each of these so that you remember them and be able to apply them in all the different situations. And also just be really aware of if they substitute the ring with other stuff, just to pick out that active bit, that phenol bit that actually produces the characteristic sets of reactions. Also, obviously here and here, I just 
basically rotated the phenol ring with the OH in, in slightly different positions, but it means the same thing. So just be really aware and be flexible with your knowledge. So that concludes this video on phenol and its reactivity. If you found this video useful, ensure that you like the video and ensure that you subscribe to the channel for new videos as and when they're uploaded.